Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're having a opportunity through this global summit to discuss a topic which is extremely important to the youth of the world and especially the youth of the Jamaat Ahmadiyya. I have been asked to talk about the concept of suffering in terms of religion. In this respect, I wanted to begin with a, a contemporary study that was done in America some years ago. And they asked Americans that if you had a chance to ask God one question and you knew God was going to answer, what question would you ask him? Based on this survey, the number one question that people were saying they would love to ask God this question was, God, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Why is there so much pain? Now, this question, again, was years ago, but you can see, particularly now, under the global pandemic, how many more people will be asking this question right now to God Almighty? God, what we just went through last year in 2020 and continuing to go through in parts of the world, why? They say you are a God of mercy, a God of love, a God of compassion. The prophet of, God of, of, of Islam once said, when he saw a, a, a woman questioning the same thing, that, oh, prophet of God, look at this scene in front of me. And what she was watching was a woman running on a battlefield. And everywhere she saw a child who was crying out, suffering for the perhaps the mother wasn't around, or well, something was going on. She would pick that child up and, and hold it close to her breast. And she said to the prophet of, of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, that is not God at least as merciful and compassionate as this mother who was caring for every single soul she can see in her sight and lifting that soul up and relieving it of its pain and suffering? So the question is not one modern just for America, but it's a question that's always been there, in fact, throughout human history. That if you say God is good, God is mercy, God is great, and has control on all things, then why this world has so much trouble? How, how come people go through so many stresses and strains in life? And even good people, we're not talking about people who don't believe in God, even the believers in God. In fact, in some cases, the believers seem to have it worse than the believe, disbelievers. So it's a question that really causes a person to stop for a moment and think. And this is the ultimate question that atheists say, those who don't believe in God, that's the big wall. That's the insurmountable object. That's the elephant in the room that you cannot give us a satisfying answer for. And so even the believers, I'd imagine even the youth in the world, sometimes struggle with this question. If they can't answer it, they haven't found a good answer. And yet, if you look in the scripture, the beauty is that if an American can ask this question in the 21st century, do you think God didn't know it back 14 centuries ago when he sent his prophet Muhammad to this world and began talking to him about what's going to happen in the world he created himself and the people who's going to be in his world? Do we believe God did not know that someone's going to ask the question, God, why did you, do, why did you create all this pain and suffering and misery in the world? Of course he knew. And he answers the question in the mouth of a prophet in Arabia to satisfy the mind of a person in America. What did he say? There are many points in scripture where he speaks to the prophet of Islam and tries to explain and help us understand that it's not about suffering and pain. It is about love and mercy if you understood the whole plan of life. And that's where we have to first look, the plan of life. So in a verse of the Quran, God is speaking to the Prophet of Islam, and he's saying to him that, Tabarak al blessed is he. The Prophet of God is talking about God. Tabarak al bi mulk. In whose hand is the entire kingdom? 
So again, the prophet is saying, that being is blessed who has control all, all of creation. Right? And he describes this being as one, he has power over everything. Not just he is, he's like, like the king, he is the controller, the master, the author of the entire universe. So yes, definitely, we should ask this being who has control. And then the next verse says that this is the being then who's going to tell us his plan of life. So now if we're going to ask, okay, what's the mind of God? That question you asked him, right? Oh, God, what's, what was your mind when you brought this kingdom into being and you had power over it? And he says, He created death and life. The two aspects of life, life and death. For what purpose? To try and test all of you to see which of you are the best in conduct. That's the sole purpose of coming into this arena, this, this lab or whatever you want to call it, this planet Earth in our limited sphere of life, so that we can be on this constant trial of life and death, which is the greatest test. I want to live. Who doesn't say that? Even the person at the last moments of life, at the back against the wall and everything against them, they're fighting to survive. This is the, this is the human spirit. It's in everyone and everything. In fact, it's in all life. Life strives to live. It doesn't seek death. It wants to avoid death at all costs. It does whatever it can not to die. It does everything it can to avoid the pain, the suffering, the loss of death, right? This is how we are. This is how we're wired. This is what makes us a progressive human creation above everything else that's out there. And the beauty of it is, as, as we've moved along in our evolutionary path, that deeper sense of self-worth related to life has only refined and made us even better than those that are below us, made us greater than the simple organisms that started out life. Now, if you know biology and the beginning of the of origin of life, you know simple single cells. And you think about those simple single cells, what you would say to God is, oh God, I like that life better. I want to go back and be an amoeba because amoeba didn't feel so much pain as I'm feeling right now. Amoeba don't feel cold, it don't feel heat, it don't feel the pain of loss of a loved one. It doesn't have the same sense of hunger and thirst and the drive to, to want to do something with the creative talents you have. It just, it's just floating around, it's a simple amoeba, and it's happy. So I remember uh, the fourth Khalifa, Hazrat Mr. Tarad Ahmad, Allah bless him always, he spoke about this in his book called Revelation Rationality. And he said, those people who complain of the suffering of life, you ask them, you give them a choice. Would you want to be that worm beneath your feet? Who, in a sense, is probably quite happy living in its, 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 its realm of dirt and whatever it's eating and has lack of sensory perception of a lot of pain as we have. But the poor worm is of a lower consciousness and doesn't feel as much pain as we do. It's not suffering because you ripped that poor worm out of its family system in the ground and took it to the ocean to, to, to be used for fish. And so what anyone in this world who's asking God, why suffering, would want to go back to a level where we didn't suffer so much and think that's a better world for us, think that that's a better plan. God, keep us all at that level of a lower consciousness where we don't have the struggles we have now in the human family. And I'm sure there's very few, even amongst atheists, who would say, yeah, that's a better life. I, I think that's the way to go. And so we understand from this concept that the trial of life and death is what brought us from that lower organism called the amoeba to what is now the human being and continues to propel us forward on the path of progress and evolution and perfection of our beings. And this is a mercy, a blessing, that comes from that being who understood his creation better than anyone else. In this sense, again, 
a verse of Quran speaks about, it's universal. So there's no injustice in this system in which we all live. You could say that if it was like a system where only the haves are getting it and the haves not, then you would say, God, you're unjust. We are suffering in this part of the world in America, but the people in the other part of the world are not suffering. So God, your system is imbalanced. But as we can see across the board, as I said, not even those who disbelieve in God. Imagine the case of those who believe in God. God says, even them, you're going to go through this trial of life and death. And the Quran then speaks to this in the second chapter, where it says, and I, we will try you. Bishayin with something, min al khawf, of fear, well, Jew and hunger. Well, naqsim min al amwali, and loss from your wealth and your own beings, well, thamarat, and your livelihood. Thamarat in Arabic can also be your offspring, because if you are a tree, so to speak, then you produce something which can be like fruit. So in all those cases, you see, these are what universal trials of life. Across the board, everyone suffers them, even the prophets of God, those whom God loves the most. And in the next verse, it gives a solution. It says, and give glad tidings, who pass through this life, knowing this trial and test, and are patient. And what do they say? Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi Now, when a Muslim hears these words, they automatically think about death. They say, oh, he's talking about death here. But look at the verse. The verse is not talking about death. The one I quoted earlier is talking about the polarity of life, that you're striving to get away from death. So while you're striving to get away from death, what are you crossing? What are you facing in life? You're facing all of these struggles and challenges, fear, hunger, the, the worry about providing for yourself, food, clothing, shelter, et cetera, taking care of your loved ones. And if you don't get hit by one of them, you'll be, you will get hit by one of the other. No one gets a, a, a free pass in this world. And that's the equality, not even the prophets. And thus you say, oh God, all good comes from you. And all good returns to you. And it's a prayer we've been taught, and sometimes we forget that when you lose something, you say, what do you say? Oh, oh help me. You, know, you don't say, oh, help me. You say, oh, God, you gave this to me to begin with. Oh, God, you can give to me again. So anything that is a benefit is what God creates. He creates light, not death. He creates light, not darkness. It's the absence of life that is death, or the absence of, of light that is darkness. So we want to strive for light and life. That is what is the, the, the source of our peace and comfort. And that is what the, the, the Quran is talking about. So herein, I'm reminded of the case of a, a woman once who was pointed out to a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he said, should I show you someone who was a, of the people of paradise? And the companion who, who was listening to him said, yes, yes, show me. And he pointed this dark-skinned woman, black woman, who was there. And he said, this is a lady who once came to the prophet of Islam. And what did she say when, he, when she met him? She said, oh, prophet of God, I'm suffering from epilepsy. She has the fits, right? And when I have a bout of ep epilepsy, I fall down, and my garments become unloosened, and my body is exposed. So imagine the struggle, right? You talk about suffering and pain and mental anguish. Think about this poor lady, what she's saying I'm going through right now. I'm having a health problem that is, it's a long-term health battle. You know, it's not something that's comes like a cold or something. This is something you deal with for a long time. And she has a sense of her own modesty that she doesn't like to be exposed to this society because she's become a Muslim. So pray for me, she says. But what did the prophet of God Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, do? Did he say, oh yes, oh God, relieve her of, this, of her struggles? He always understood and epitomized the verse of Quran I started with, that life is a struggle, but give glad tidings to those who are patient and prayerful, that they will earn blessings in the process. Life will not detract from the fact 
that they have something that puts them at a lower condition than others. So he said to her, I tell you, I give you two options. And you decide which one you have chosen. Option one is I will pray and God will move this ailment from you. And you can go on with your life. Or option two is I will pray that God gives you patience and you deal with it. And I give you glad tidings of paradise. Two great options to think about. I can be free of this epilepsy, exposure to of, of my nakedness to the world, and go on with my life and have a good life now. Or I can deal with this. I can bear with what I had to cross in my path and be patient and trust that in the end, God will reward me for that patience. So she thought about it, and she said, Oh, prophet of God, I will be patient. But I request you, please, to pray for me at least that when I have a fit, my body is not exposed. My nakedness is not shown to the world. And this is where she ended her request again. And this is a lesson for us to learn about suffering and pain. It is always in a perspective. It's relative. It's not a complete de definition that this is what pain or suffering is. It will change from person to person. And so Prophet of Islam says that when you're suffering, always look down, never look up. Because you'll find someone looking down who is worse than you. Think about this world. Who was worse than you? The old story is I used to complain by not having any shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Heard the expression? Once someone asked the prophet of this age, Hazrat Mizal Ghulam Ahmad Ali of Qadiyan, Prophet that you claim that God loves you and that God loves those who believe in him. Yet what we see is that you and those who you say God loves are enduring more trials and tribulation than those whom he does not love or who do not love him. So why is that? Hazrat Ahmad answered and said, it may be so as you think, but go and ask those people who are going through what you believe is a trial, trouble, tribulation. What do they think? And if they believe that trial and tribulation, as you perceive it, is really ecstatic joy, and they're embracing it and enjoying it, and they don't see it as a trial, but they see it as a gift, a bounty that came from God Almighty, how can you call that a trial and tribulation? He deeply understood a philosophy of life that prophets of God understand. As I said, they all go through it. The prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, who we believe to be the best of all creation, who we believe that God is saying to him that if I hadn't created you, O prophet Muhammad, there would be no need to create this heaven and earth. It was all done because I knew there would be someone like you to come on my earth to love and worship and obey me. But how did he treat the one in this narrative, in this, this concept that he loved so much. Was he not orphaned twice in his childhood? Did he not lose the love of the next person who was his patron, his grandfather, and then his uncle? Did he not marry and then face the loss of that wife years later? Well, for three years, they were struggling in a, in a valley where they were completely boycotted and had no food and water. It was so stressful time for them that some companions said that they were so hungry that they never walked along and felt anything soft beneath their feet and they wouldn't even bother looking at it. They would just, just grab it and throw it in the mouth. They were being beaten and dragged through the streets. They were being killed. They had to face war. The prophet of Islam had his teeth broken out. One of his companions had heard this who could not be there, always cut knee. Once he heard that the prophet of Islam lost his teeth, he was so overwhelmed with grief at the loss of this prophet, he broke his own teeth. Thinking about the pain of his beloved one. And his daughter was killed. His uncle 
was martyred in the field of battle and had his, his liver torn out and chewed by his enemy. And he had to endure all these things. And this is the one you say that God loved the most. And I'm just giving you a small glimpse of what he went through and endured. But in fact, he himself was the one who spent nights upon nights upon nights glorifying and praising and worshiping God and thanking him, as I mentioned early, about those who see not struggles. These are not stumbling blocks. These were their stepping stones that get higher and higher. And this is how they rose up. The Prophet Islam told a story about one great Muslim saint. His name was Bayazid al-Bistami. And it's a wonderful story about this whole concept. And he was this saint in a town where there were other families who had saints amongst them, and they were jealous of him. And they thought that how could this man of a lower family and of no standing rise up to be considered a saint and God talks to him. We're better off than him. So God informed Bayazid al-Bustami of this attitude. And he addressed the crowd one day and he told, told them this parable. He said, it's like the difference between water and oil. It's mentioned that one night Oil mixed with water was burning in a, in, a, in a lamp, and the two began to, to debate. And oil said that, you know, you're heavier and dirtier than me, and I am the source of purity, and I'm very refined. Yet, when we're together, you always rise above me. Why is that so? How come you're above me? Why do you float above me, and I am this pure, purifying agent? And oil addressed water and said, you have no idea what I went through to become oil. <laughs> You have no concept. I was first a seed and buried deep in the earth. I had no light, nothing, just completely buried as with nothingness. And finally, I grew and fought my way back to the surface. And as soon as I got up, they cut me down, <laughs> sliced me from the root and, and dragged me out. And then they began to refine me and, and pull me through a, a mechanism pulverize me and grind me in a mill. And finally, through all that process of grinding and cutting and, and, and pushing me into this pulver, into this nothingness, I became oil. So through this process, should I not have risen above you from all that I endured? This is, and I will try you with something of loss, of everything you hold dear. But if you are patient, and you go through this trial, like any trial or test in life, you become a person who has excellence in degrees based on your level of trial. And thus, this is the overarching theme that the Quran talks about, that suffering is relative to that being who is human, striving for perfection, to evolve from a lower to a higher level. And no one wants to devolve from a higher to a lower level and think that is happiness. Yes, suffering and pain and all these things we, we, we feel. And yet it's a life lesson that we all go through. And we know there's benefit in it. In 1996, maybe you've seen the scene or you've seen a clip of it. We had the centennial celebration of the Olympics. It was held in America in, in a city called Atlanta, Georgia. And they were wondering that who would be the person who would have the honor of lighting the Olympic torch. This was going to be a grand honor for anyone in America. That person represented the best of America. That person represented the highest ideals and hope of a sportsman, of, of a, a statesman, of the true American. And so at the moment that the person ran up with the cauldron to hand it off. The whole world was watching. 3.5 billion people, they said, were watching this scene. Who, who's it going to be? And suddenly, almost out of nowhere, appeared this figure that the whole world gasped when they saw. It was Muhammad Ali, who was considered the greatest heavyweight boxer of all time. He grabbed that torch, and with hands shaking, he lit the cauldron and started the Olympic Games. 
But it was this scene that really caught, captured the eyes. Muhammad Ali was that person who used to, he said, I used to float at like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And his prose, his, back then that, that uh, poetry, which nowadays will be like uh, a rap almost, that itself would cause his, his opponents to run in fear because he had such a, a sharp whip in a, in, a, in, a, in a tongue of oratory. He had physical prowess. People feared him. He had all these gifts. He was a good looking man. He was the greatest champion of all time. And yet here on that stage, his hand was shaking. Why? Because he had contracted a disease called Parkinson's and was losing all that physical prowess, losing that gift of oratory, losing the ability to hold even a simple torch in his hand without shaking. And he is the man who used to say, I am the greatest. No one can beat me. Look at me. I float like a butterfly, I sting like a bee. No one can take out Muhammad Ali. But he would later on say in his life, those last 10, 20 years of his life taught him some great lessons. He said that God gave me Parkinson's disease so I would know that he is the greatest and not me. And that is the humility that he learned from that lesson of a suffering disease for 20 years of plus of his life, of losing all those faculties he had that, that the world honored and respected and enjoyed, and living a humble life of reclusion, away from the spotlight, the fame and the fortune was all gone, but he did not care. He had found his purpose and his peace with God, and he was satisfied in that condition of life. And this is the lesson that it's not just for a prophet of God, not just a person living 14 centuries ago in the time of the prophet of Islam, who he said is going to be heaven bound. But even now in this day and age, for those who are fortunate to understand their purpose of life and to let the trials and challenges of life bring them closer to that purpose and not further away. The hot water, as they say, is the same for the potato or the egg, right? You heard the expression. It can make you soft or it can make you hard. It all depends on what's inside you. Better or bitter. And life, therefore, is, again, equal for all of us. Yes, in this day and age, if we think about what our fourth caliph said, the scheme of life. Take that away. Let everyone be the same a world where there's no sickness, there's no hunger, there's no, no trouble, and say to God Almighty, let there be no more suffering, no more pain, no more trials and tribulations and troubles. Let there be no, no more pandemics, earthquakes, no floods. Let every villager, wherever they may be, have as much as every city dweller in every developed nation. And think about what that would mean for us as a human world, much less the animal and insect and lower creation. What would motivate you and I to go beyond where we are at that point. Would not I come to a standstill? Have we not seen that sometimes the children of the most wealthy and famous, they sit in a life of almost inertia? With nothing to do. No purpose. No goals but to spend up mommy and daddy's money, and that's it. And that doesn't even satisfy them. If the richest, the wealthiest, the healthiest, the, the most connected people in the world are the best, then why aren't they the happiest? Why do they suffer even as much as anyone else on this planet? Why are the, the beautiful people, if someone says, oh God, why didn't you make me so beautiful like so-and-so? Why do the beautiful people get divorced and face struggles in their own homes and don't find satisfaction in their relationships any more than you do the so-called ugly people who aren't as beautiful? Why do all these things happen? When the Quran also says about nations, if you're going to go that way, that even nations can't complain that we are the poor ones. Once in 1970, the third Khalifa went to visit Africa. The first visit of a Khalifa to Africa. And he addressed the Nigerians. And in that address, he pointed out that you and I, weren't always part of the undeveloped world. At one point, we were developed and civilized, and we had powerful empires and civilizations. 
And you and I, therefore, cannot think that God didn't give us something in our history of, of a civilization, of a nation, that lets us know that he cared about us too. This is the thing we think about the world. Think about South America and the, the Aztec, the Mayan, the Incan empires. We go down, down, down the, you see the ruins and say, oh, look at these interesting ruins. You forget that those were people who you look at now as being the poor, the undeveloped world. They were the civilized powerful nation. The Quran talks about them, that there were, there were civilizations that lived, existed, that are even more powerful than you. God didn't forget anybody. He gave everyone a chance. And so it's only a matter of relative how you see someone right now. The complexion of a skin, because you're part of that part of the world, a brown or black or red, in this current modern era may be something that is looked down upon. But at some era, it was the one you aspired to be. And it will keep changing. God calls this ayam, ayam Allah, the days of God. They keep changing. He keeps giving everyone in this world opportunity to rise up, enjoy it, and then go back and struggle again, rise and enjoy, enjoy it and struggle again. I sometimes tell my friends, you know, you go to a hospital and look at the person who's lying with all those things hooked to their body and think about them. They're sometimes going through that struggle of life and death, and they're at the critical point of life and death. Any moment could be that last moment for them. And you walk in the room and you see that, that monitor that's, that's hooked up. And I say, look at that monitor. If you see the machine going like this, movement, it means something. If you see it go like that, it means something else. What most people want, they want like this. Let it be real smooth and flat and easy, God. OK, I'll make that for you if that's what you want. Real smooth and flat and easy. <laughs> you ask me, God, I want this. <laughs> that's life. That is the challenge of life. That is the motivation of life. That keeps pushing us forward. And that is the beauty of life that those who complain to God don't understand. It is in this arena, this struggle of life, that all of us continue to, to move forward and gain the progression that we see throughout the world, individually and collectively. So in a nutshell, what our beloved prophet of God, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, learned 14 centuries ago, answered the question that not just Americans today, but humans throughout the course of human history have been ask asking and have given them the way forward that this life will have some challenges. There will be some trials. At times, you will suffer. You will feel pain. You can't take that away from the human experience. That is what human is. But if you follow the course of striving to do, do your best and be your best, you will survive. You will thrive. You will reach a higher level with each passing generation, each successive group that comes on Earth within yourself and around yourself. And this is what will lead us to the higher levels of our own conscious, whether it's just mental, moral, spiritual, and make us reach the goal and purpose of our life. And that is the answer which I believe even today, as youth are struggling with this issue, why I'm born in so-and-so country, how come they're richer and we're, we're poorer? Why is there disease and destruction? Oh, God, stop, stop the lightning from falling so that no one gets hit by lightning. Very few people die from lightning bolts. The most death comes from human hands, wars. This pandemic taught us that. It wasn't the virus that killed most people. It was the response or lack thereof to the presence of a, a novel virus, I mean, a new one. And those countries that responded quickly and understood the science and took care of their citizens, guess what? They did not suffer. They have not lost life and had their society destroyed as much as those nations 
some of them powerful, rich nations, who failed to do so. Unnecessary loss of life because we as a human creature, creation have lack of knowledge. And so the difference between this world and the next when we get there and can ask God all the questions you want, in that world, the believers greet each other with a greeting that says, "Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. And the last thing they'll say is, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, all praise belongs to God. Why? Because now there's no more pain and suffering. Now we understand all the laws, all of the system that God has put us into. And we don't make the mistake. If I can't swim, I don't jump in water. If I don't have an asbestos suit on, I don't put my hand in fire. If I don't understand how this virus works, and I got to learn that lesson and put up some warnings and do what I got to do. But once I learn that, the virus won't take me out in the next life because God teaches me all, all those things. This is why this is a different world that we're going to go into. Now with that, I, I feel that I want to end it only on this last thought. That the atheist wants a world where they are the designer. The atheist wants a world where they are the one who's controlling what comes out of the lab. And you give them that power. And you ask them the question, what would you change? What aspect of this suffering would you make different? Would you create the sharks with the, sh with the, with the razor edged teeth floating in the oceans, but as soon as a man dives in, his teeth turn to feathers? Would you make the eagle with the claws that will swoop down to, to capture the prey, but as soon as it swoops down, it will not hurt anything. No prey can be captured by that, that beast of, of the air. Would you make the fire so that it can burn and destroy, but as soon as it comes near home, all of a sudden it becomes water. Properties that will now wash the walls, not burn the walls. How would you change the laws? What would you design your babies? So they, they had this concept some time ago with cloning babies or making babies getting genetic, genetic codes to now say, I want a baby with brown eyes or blue eyes or, or this complexion or that kind of hair. How would you form the human creation so that everyone now is happy? All have this color or that feature or, or, or those qualities. Where still someone would not complain. If not today, a generation or two down the road who says, we no longer like thin people, we like heavy people. It keeps changing, right? The standard of beauty around the world, the standard of happiness, what makes you happy. So what would they do to God's creation to create that kind of equilibrium that everyone now in their world is happy or not just at the mercy of the forces of chance to let it be as you wish? In that case, then you're still not any better off than you are right now. All you do is taken God out of the equation and made your chance a scapegoat. Yeah, it's all chance, so it's all good. You don't have it, you don't have it. It's just not my fault. You know, you should have been born rich, you're born poor, so that's, that's how it is. Is that world any better? And I think we can see from that, the world that is proposed in that case would not be any better or be worse. And as I mentioned before, Everything would come to a standstill if you made it all equal because there'd be no impetus, no motivation to propel us forward for change. This is what is the difference between the concept of suffering according to the Muslim perspective and the real world and according to those who denounce the world or deny the existence of God because of suffering. And I hope that we can look at this and see some glimpse of a deeper appreciation and understanding of the world we're in and be able to utter those words when we face out our trials and tribulations that, oh God, you are absolutely good and all good came from you. And oh God, all good returns to you. So let me also in this world remember that and strive to be as good as I can be so when I return to you, you'll admit me amongst those who you see has, have done the best in conduct as possible 
and forgive any fault or shortcoming and admit me amongst those who are the heirs, the inheritors of that garden which will bring so much peace that when a person is asked, according to Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, in the garden, the paradise, did you suffer in the world anything, any hardship? He said the person who is the most wretched of all souls, who finally reaches the heaven, is asked this question. Did you suffer at all in this world? And he will say, after having dipped, just a dip in paradise, he'll say, oh God, I didn't suffer at all in this world. Not a moment of, of, of trouble did I have. This is not something where he's saying because of just a temporary kind of uh, forgetfulness of, of the joy. It's the reality. Add it all up. What would be a few years of some struggle if God gave you so many decades of, of enjoyment? What's a few days of hunger or a few months or a, a generation of some struggle if he gave your group generations and centuries of, of blessing? We can never count all the favors of God. And when we do, we realize it's a very small window of str struggle and suffering that is there. And so the inmates of heaven realize that, that oh God, I didn't suffer. It's like a little prick. Oh, that was nothing. I forgot that. What, what are you talking about? Yeah, yesterday you were walking around with, you know, you, holding your head and crying, oh, I forgot all that. That was yesterday. Today I'm, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm happy, I'm, I'm ready to move, let's go. And that's how this world is. So may we remember this and be in this world heaven bound and be in the world those who enter heaven and praise God and remember how much. And akhri da'wana, our last word is, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.